Hi everybody, my name is Miguel Angel Sebastian and I'm going to present a paper called Not a Hot Dream. Before starting, I want to thank all of you for attending the conference and very especially to Richard Brown for organizing it. Last year, in the Second Consciousness Online Conference, Hartman Law presented a paper called Sensory Awareness and Perceptual Certainty followed by a discussion with Ned Block, Dave Chalmers and David Rosenthal. One of the most interesting issues in this interchange was the relevance of the data presented by Law for the philosophical discussion among higher order theories and first order theories. My aim today is going to be to show that they are relevant but precisely in the opposite direction as the one intended by the authors. Here is the outline of my talk. I will start by presenting phenomenal consciousness and higher order thought theories. Higher order thought theories are going to be the target of my argument. Then, I will present the Passingham and Lau experiment that suggests that the neural correlate of higher order thought is located in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. After that, I'm going to present some evidence to the effect that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is highly deactivated during the conscious experience we have during sleep, namely dreams. So all of you can already anticipate what my argument is going to be. Precisely the argument will be presented in section 4. I can think of two possible ways that my opponent can try to resist the argument. I'm going to present these two possibilities in section 5 and try to rejoin them. I will finally present my conclusions. In our confusion about the function of consciousness, Ned Block famously claimed that our folk psychological term consciousness equivocates between two different notions, access consciousness and phenomenal consciousness. The relation between phenomenal consciousness and access consciousness is very controversial. That it is platitudinous that something that deserves the name access is essential to our phenomenology. When one has a phenomenally conscious experience, one is in a certain sense aware of it. So, everybody will agree that phenomenal consciousness requires some form of awareness. My target in this talk are going to be theories that maintain that awareness is a form of cognitive accessibility. More precisely, the same cognitive accessibility that underlies our ability to report. This claim has been explicitly endorsed by higher order thought theories. So my next step is going to be to present higher order thought theories. <clears throat> According to higher thought theories, a mental state M is conscious if and only if there is another mental state, a higher order one, to the effect that one is in M. In this case, awareness is explained as being the target of the appropriate higher order thought. David Rosenthal, one of the main proponents of this theory, explicitly endorse the correspondence between higher order thought and the ability to report being in a particular state. In Thinking That One Thinks, David Rosenthal writes, Given that a creator has suitable communicative ability, it will be able to report being in a particular mental state just in case that is, intuitively, a conscious mental state. If the state is not a conscious state, it will be unavailable to one as the topic of a sincere report about the current content of the mind. And if the mental state is conscious, one will be aware of it and hence able to report that one is in it. The ability to report being in a particular mental state therefore corresponds to what we intuitively think of as that state being in our stream of consciousness. We can distinguish two different competing theories of consciousness. On the one hand, 
higher theories maintain that consciousness requires awareness, where this awareness depends on the cognitive accessibility that underlies reporting. On the other hand, first of the theories agree that some form of awareness is constitutive of phenomenal consciousness, but deny that this form of awareness depends on the cognitive access that underlies our reporting abilities. So, there could be cases of phenomenally conscious states on which we cannot report. Let me present the Lao and Passingham experiment. This experiment strongly suggests that the cognitive ability that underlies reporting depends on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex would be the neural correlate of higher order thought. Here is the setup of the experiment. Subjects in the experiment were asked to fixate their gaze in this point and they are presented with two possible stimuli either a white diamond or a white square after a certain period of time the SOA a mask will appear this mask overlaps with part of the contour of the target without leaving gaps or overlapping with the target especially the mask will difficult the perception of the target. Subjects in the experiment were asked two questions after the presentation of the target and the mask. First, they have to decide whether a diamond or a square was presented and secondly, they have to indicate whether they actually saw the target or they were simply guessing in their reply to the first question. The first question is intended to measure the objective performance capacity of the subject. The second question is intended to measure the perceptual certainty of the subject, how confident they are on having seen the object. This subjective report, according to the authors and to higher theories, is an indication of phenomenal consciousness. The result of the experiment is shown in this graphic. This graphic presents the result of the experiment as a function of the SOA. The continuous line presents the percentage of correct replies to the first question and is an indication of the performance capacity of the subject. The dotted line presents the replies to the subjects to the second question and is an indication of the perceptual certainty. We can see the effect of the mask on both the performance capacity and the perceptual certainty. As the time between the presentation of the stimuli and the mask increases, both the performance capacity and the perceptual certainty decrease until a certain moment where the mask has no effect in the perception. What is interesting of this kind of graphic is its usage yes, because we can identify two points where the performance capacity of the subjects is the same but where they differ in their perceptual certainty. They claim having seen the stimuli in the long SOA condition but not in the short SOA condition. This, according to the authors, and to hot theories is an indication of phenomenal consciousness. The subject in the long SOA condition is phenomenally conscious of the stimuli but not in the short SOA. Lau and Passingham perform an fMRI study on the subject of the experiment. The study revealed that the long SOA condition, the one associated with phenomenal consciousness according to the authors, was associated with a significant increase in the activity of the left mid-dorsolateral prefrontal cortex in Broadman Area 46. My opponent maintains that awareness, 
depends on the cognitive accessibility that underlies reporting. This experiment by Lau and Passingham shows that the subject report having seen the stimulus in the long SOA condition, but not in the short one. This long SOA condition, so the difference between the long SOA condition and the short SOA conditions, when we look into the brain, are differences in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. Since HOTS are associated with report abilities, Lau and Passingham have found the neural correlate of HOTS, at least in the case of visual experiences. So, the cognitive access underlying reports in the case of visual experiences depends on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So let's have a look to the interpretation of the data. Higher the theories maintain that the subject is phenomenally conscious only in the long SOA condition. So this seeing curve corresponds to phenomenal consciousness. On the other hand, the first order advocate agrees that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the correlate of the cognitive accessibility underlying reporting. But he would deny that the seeing curve correspond to phenomenal consciousness. The curve corresponding to phenomenal consciousness will be, as Ned Block noted last year, somewhere in between the correct curve and the seeing curve. Will lie somewhere between our perceptual capacity and our perceptual certainty. Let's have a look to what happens during sleep. During sleep, we have dreams. Dreams are defined by Rebonsu, for instance, as subjective experience during sleep consisting of complex and organized images that show temporal progression. Our dreams are highly visual with rich colors, shapes and movements and include sounds, smells, taste, tactile sensation and emotion, as well as pain and pleasure. Reports to that effect have been recorded by Hobson and colleagues. Our sleep is traditionally divided into two phases. The non-rapid eye movement or NREM phase and the REM phase. Dreams occur, though probably not exclusively, during the REM phase. If subjects are awakened during this REM phase, they will report having been dreaming on more than 80% of the cases. So let's have a look to the neurophysiology of the phase in which we have dreams, the REM phase. Let me start by noticing that during sleep there is a global reduction in metabolic activity and blood flow, a reduction up to the 40 percent. At a level, during the non-REM phase, there is a reduction in the activity of many areas, for instance the orbitofrontal and the anterior cingulate. But what is interesting is that there is a reduction in the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, the area that we have identified as the neural correlate of HOTS. What is even more interesting is that there is a further decrease of the activity of this area during the REM phase. So, there is a decrease in the activity of the activity of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex if we compare end REM phase and wakefulness and there is a further decrease during the REM phase. Those theories that maintain that the cognitive access underlying reporting is essential to phenomenal consciousness would have predicted an increase in the activity of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex when comparing the REM phase and the non-REM phase, because it is during this phase when we have dreams. However, what happens is precisely the opposite. So, all of you can already anticipate what's going to be my argument against higher order thought theories. Let's have a look to it. <clears throat> higher order theories 
maintain that phenomenal consciousness requires awareness, where this awareness is dependent on the cognitive accessibility that underlies reporting. This will give us the first premise of the argument, namely, phenomenal consciousness depends on the cognitive accessibility that underlies reporting. Lau and Passingham experiment shows that the cognitive accessibility that underlies reporting, at least in the case of visual experiences, depends on the left dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So, the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is necessary for visual phenomenal consciousness. We have visual conscious experience during the REM phase, namely dreams. But this area is highly deactivated while we are dreaming. So the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is not necessary for visual experiences. And the conclusion follows. Phenomenal consciousness does not depend on the cognitive accessibility that underlies reporting. I can see two possible ways in which my opponent can try to block the argument. The first one would be to accept that the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the neural correlate of HOTS, but only during wakefulness. During sleep, there is another area that would be responsible for higher thoughts. An alternative way to block my argument is deny premise for, deny that there are conscious experience during sleep, there are no dreams. I'm going to try to rejoin these possible objections in the next section. Let's have a look to the first possible reply. My opponent will agree that the neural correlate of HOTS during wakefulness lies on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, but he would postulate that this function is performed by a different area during sleep, maybe the anterior cingulate. REM sleep seems to be exclusive to marsupial and placental mammals. This suggests that only those beings at the top of the evolutionary pyramid can have dreams. The plausibility of the evolution of a different area for having HOTS during sleep will depend on the function of dream. Theories of dreams yield them as epiphenomena. For instance, the activation synthesis theory holds that dreams are the result of the forebrain responding to random activity coming from the brainstem. In this case, dreams are nothing but noise activity. Other theories either maintain that dreams have a function in memory processing, in which case there is no function for HOTS and dreams merely reflect the corresponding memory processing, or are regarded as some kind of hallucination that protects sleep without any function for HOTS. One exception is Rebonsu. According to him, the function of dreams is to simulate threatening events and to rehearse threat perception and threat avoidance. But this function can also be performed during wakefulness, so the same structure that we use while we are awake could be used during sleep. There is no evolutionary pressure that justifies the appearance of a different area to perform HOTS during sleep. As long as one cannot make the case for a function of HOT in dreams, and I seriously doubt that it can be made, we have no additional reason for defending the possibility of having another neural structure that differs from the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex for having HOTS. If this is right, and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is the neural correlate of HOTS responsible for visual experiences, then we have good reasons for believing that there are no visual HOTS during dreams. An alternative objection would deny that we have phenomenally conscious experiences during sleep. This is the next objection that I'm going to consider. 
the common sense position maintains that dreams are conscious experiences. This position has been maintained by philosophers, psychologists and neuroscientists, but not without exception. This common sense position has famously been rejected by Malcolm. He claims that it leads to a conceptual incoherency. He says, the notion of a dream as an occurrence that is logically independent of the sleeper's waking impression has no clear sense. Malcolm maintains that we have no reason to believe the reports given by awakened subjects for there is no way to verify them. They could be just cases of false memory. It could be that processes during the ring phase are non-conscious and that on awakening there is a hot targeting the content of memory and thereby making it conscious. Whereas Malcolm denies that there are dreams, then it has defended a skeptical position. According to Dennett, before establishing whether dreams are conscious, we need an empirical theory of dream, and that it is an open and theoretical question whether dreams fall inside or outside the boundaries of experience. So, according to hot theories, consciousness necessitates the presence of a hot. Hots are absent during dreams, so dreams are unconscious experiences. Skepticism about dreams bases its position on the fact that the access to dreams is retrospective. We recall the dream when we are awakened, and we have no reason for trusting these reports. However, there are cases in which some people are aware of being dreaming. This is the case of lucid dreams. In lucid dreams, the dreamer is able to remember the circumstances of normal life and to act upon reflection. Although lucid dreams have been reported since Aristotle, many have had their doubts about the reality of these episodes. Dennett, for instance, endorses this skepticism. He considers that the report of lucid dreams is consistent with the subject dreaming that she is aware of being dreaming. But there are empirical evidence that suggests that Dennett's hypothesis is wrong. The empirical evidence in favor of lucid dreams comes in two steps. In a first experiment, Rothbard saw it that some of the eye movement during the REM sleep correspond to the reported direction of the dreamer's gaze. Based on this evidence, Laverts and colleagues could provide evidence in favor of lucid dreams. They trained frequently lucid dreamers and asked them to make a distinctive pattern of voluntary eye movement when they realized that they were dreaming. These prearranged eye movement signals were recorded by the polygraph records during REM, proving that the subject had indeed been lucid during the REM sleep. This result has been replicated by other laboratories. The experiment on lucid dreams provide evidence that we have conscious experience during sleep and give us the opportunity to record reports to that effect. So the main reason for skepticism is dissolved. There are conscious dreams. My opponent can still try to resist the argument by maintaining that we have conscious experiences during lucid dreams, but not during ordinary dreams, for only during lucid dreams can the subjects report on them. This half-baked reply distinguishing lucid dreams from other dreams seems to be something of a reach. Furthermore, lucid dreams occur during the REM phase, and during this phase it, there is a deactivation of the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. It is an open question whether this area is active or not during lucid dreams. I want to finish this talk by summarizing the paper. We have seen that hot theories maintain that phenomenal consciousness requires a certain form of awareness and that this awareness, according to these theories, is dependent on the cognitive accessibility that underlies reporting. I have argued 
that this kind of access is not necessary for consciousness, for we lack it during the experiences that we have during sleep, namely dreams. La Passingham experiment provides good evidence for believing that the neural correlate of this cognitive access lies on the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, that this area is highly deactivated during sleep. I have argued that we have no reason for believing that the function of HOTS is implemented by a different area during sleep. Alternatively, the defender of HOT theories can embrace a skeptical position as to whether we have conscious dreams. This position, which runs against the common sense, has been refuted by strong empirical evidence. I want to say that the position remaining for hot theories is not a comfortable one. If the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex is activated during lucid dreams, there is no evidence in favor of this claim, hot theories has to maintain an ontological dichotomy with regard to dreams. Some dreams are phenomenally conscious and others are not. That's all. Thank you very much and I hope that you enjoy the discussion. Bye-bye. I'll see you in my dream.